Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to this ISTAT Learning Lab titled How Real Are Airline Clusters, Risks in the, in the Geopolitical World? Uh, my name is Sarah Allen. I'm head of capital markets at Airbus and also a member of the ISTAT board. I am joined today by John Zhu, who's an engagement manager at Alton Aviation Consultancy, as well as an ISTAT certified appraiser. Today, we are hosting Dr. Philip Goddeking, who is founder and managing director of Avionomics. The firm is his second entrepreneurial venture after Air Economy, which was bought by Amadeus. Philip started his career at Lufthansa and became a respected consultant at Alex Partners, Roland Berger, and BCG. He's also an honorary professor at Mainz University, where he teaches airline strategies and is the author of textbook of a textbook on airline networks. Uh, we're pleased to have Dr. Philip Kodoking today, who will be giving a presentation shortly. Before we get started, uh, I would like to remind everyone that you have the opportunity to ask questions, uh, at the, which will be um, asked at the end of the presentation. However, we kindly ask that you submit your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. Um, as questions will be answered on a first ask first answered basis. So please do not hesitate to ask your question um, throughout the presentation. Uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Philip, who will be walking us through his presentation. Over to you, Philip. Thank you very much. I hope you can see my screen. Yep, all good. Thank presentation you. mode. Many thanks for the very kind invitation to this lecture and the very kind introduction. My company thrives on the intersection of old school strategy and advanced analytics. This mix will also become clear in my presentation today. And since competitive strategies and evolutionary biology have many concepts in common, and since I'm a biologist by academic background, I will also enrich the mixture of data science and risk strategies with a little bit of evolutionary biology today. I leave it up to your judgment if that works or not. Two weeks ago, French economist Philippe Philippon, who teaches at Stern University in New York, tweeted a remarkable quote, irresponsibility times bad luck equals crisis. That sums up a lot of things very precisely, and not only in aviation. It was not originally meant to apply for aviation. But for us in risk management, of course, we have heard this concept before, because we know the concept of what Philippon refers to as responsive irresponsibility is known as loss given default, the magnitude of the risk in risk management. And what Philippon refers to as bad luck is known as probability of default or PD in risk management. And what he refers to as crisis, we call exposure at default, EAD in risk management. So the concept is not new, but I like the way Philippon has phrased it because it's very to the point. I want to show you um, the irresponsibility or loss given default of large risks are strategically non-adaptive and that such strategically non-adaptive risks face the same fate as the dinosaurs. I would like to show you how data science can help to identify risks as early as possible in order to be able to counteract them in time. I want to start with the concept of irresponsibilities or loss given default that we are seeing so massively in aviation right now. I would like to show you that there are two forces that are driving these irresponsibilities. First, economies of scale, and secondly, cluster risks. And we'll try to show you that economies of scale and cluster risks are, in essence, two sides of the same coin. Then at the end, 
for recreation two charts on what this means for airline fleet strategies. Until the beginning of the pandemic, we all considered asset risk as the prime risk in our business. How liquid is the market for a particular type of aircraft? This was the dominating risk considered and many very large leasing companies basically managed based on uh, this kind of risk and not paying attention to PD or EAD. With the beginning of the pandemic, we quickly learned that there is another risk, counterparty risk. In, um, in the beginning, our clients, banks, leasing companies, uh, were doing a lot of research on the liquidity of the airlines, quickly switching to the question of how much state aid is available for a given airline. This was the most important and overarching question, state aid, how much state aid is available. And what, to give you an example, um, and, uh, the Gulf carriers, take, take, take Emirates, take Qatar. I was always impressed by the global portfolio of destinations and considered that portfolio as a perfect example of highly diversified risk. They serve all the economic centers of the world. With the beginning of the pandemic, that highly diversified risk turned out to be a massive, massive cluster risk because there's a huge dependency on international cross-border traffic. And the pandemic has ruined that business for quite some time. And the amount of bailout needed to bail out, particularly these airlines that depend on long haul was huge. And it was a question of take it uh, by all means, whatever it takes, these airlines need to be rescued because the states, the nations depend on those airlines. That was a massive, failure of huge uh, cluster risk that materialized with the beginning of the uh, pandemic. Climate risk. Of course, we have this climate risk. We have that for quite some time. It is known. It is a subject of many discussions. There are many risks associated with the climate risk. First, the climate risk as such is a risk, but there's also a risk for our business, and that is unexpected regulation, uh, like the ban on short haul flights in France. And if we don't act um, wisely, there will be more regulation uh, in the future constraining the way we manage our business. With the war against the Ukraine, we are, had to learn that there are geopolitical risks and they can be very real. Ask Finnair. Finnair is serving Helsinki as a hub connecting Northern Europe, UK, other areas from, from Europe with China, in particular North uh, East Asia. Uh, with no longer being allowed to fly over Russia, they have a huge ge uh, geopolitical risk to continue serving their markets. In essence, it's an ex existential risk for airlines like Finnair or other airlines in Northeast Europe. If you look at these risks, what uh, if you take the airline perspective, airlines as a business, live from scale advantages. There are few other industries that depend as much on scale advantages as the airlines do. High market shares and pricing power are needed. Tr large traffic flows, otherwise you do not create the volume. Unique geographical location, like the Middle East, like uh, Finnair in Helsinki or others. Unique traffic rights, again, Finnair, betting on their unique traffic, traffic rights to China across Russia. Fleet standardization, have a huge fleet like uh, Ryanair on just a single type of aircraft, political lobbying, all being a question and a matter of size and scale. If you look at it precisely, what you observe is what looks like a scale advantage at the same time is nothing but a cluster risk. It's the same. If you have a portfolio of non-state of the art types of aircraft, you have a huge cluster risk because the need arises, will arise to renew your portfolio of aircraft. If you have a portfolio of default prone airlines, you do have a problem. Uh, if uh, fleet standardization as such is a cluster risk, if think of, of the max, that there's a huge risk if your fleet is composed of one type of aircraft that for whatever reason, all of a sudden faces a risk. If you have a portfolio of too many CO2 intensive aircraft, you will have a problem. 
uh, if you depend on politically unstable markets, you do have a cluster risk. So scale advantages and cluster risks are the same coin, but different sides of the same coin, and you cannot manage both at the same time. It's either or. Either you go for the scale advantages, then you have to accept the cluster risks that come with it, or vice versa. It's a very difficult equation, and it has not been solved wisely, or as Philippon would have said, to a level of irresponsibility in some areas. The asset risk, what we observed in the beginning of the pandemic, was too large, too old, in very simple terms. You all have uh, observed that British Airways scrapped the entire 747 fleet. Uh, Qantas, Lufthansa 380, uh, uh, China Southern uh, retiring its 380 fleet, Qatar Airways half of the 380 fleet. So everything that has four engines was at risk at the beginning of the pandemic and most likely will not return. We observe the insolvencies of, of the airlines around the world and we count the cases of insolvencies, both uh, type uh, chapter 7 and chapter 11 types of insolvencies. And what we observed is this figure. No surprise in 2008 financial crisis with a, a peak in airline insolvencies. In 2020, we had a super high peak, but still way below what you should expect if market mechanisms would have applied. So this is just the effect of protectionism and state aid that we haven't seen many, many more. So there is a, a strong volume and high number of airlines that is technically due for insolvency. And it depends on the continuation of state aid if these insolvencies will happen or not. It's not a matter of bad luck. It's just the airline as such because of its strategy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, they have a market problem. And the amount of state aid that was uh, made available to the airlines up in the pandemic from March 2020 to November 2020 was 174 billion US dollar, billion US dollar. So meanwhile, we estimate that it's well over 200 billion US dollar state aid to protect um, airlines, which otherwise would have faced insolvency. Counterparty risk. Cluster risk. Look at uh, Singapore Airlines. This is the map of the flight schedule from uh, Singapore Airlines, September 2019. All flights, all daily flights based from Singapore into the world. The same for September 20. Daily flights of SQ from Singapore into the world, just three of them. Massive implosion of a massive cluster risk. It was more than bad luck. Climate risk. The International Energy Agency, IEA, says that in 2019, the volume of CO2 emissions amounted to a little more than a gigaton of CO2. A gigaton is an, a very large number of, of, of CO2. And that if we want to reach as the av aviation industry <clears throat> net zero by 2050, we have to reduce this figure down to 210 million tons CO2 and hopefully being able to compensate the rest by offsetting mechanisms or by carbon capture or other mechanisms to get rid of CO2 in the atmosphere. This means on average, we have to reduce CO2 by about 5% annually. This is about the same figure that we have seen as the average growth rate of aviation in the last couple of years. So if the aviation industry continues to grow by 5%, and if we are able, want to be able to reduce CO2 each year by 5% in the light of continued growth of the aviation industry, this makes clear what the challenge is about. There is a risk of regulatory countermeasures, uh, simply driven by greenwashing, not being honest about what we are facing here as a climate risk. The metrics matter a lot. 
the most standard widespread measure to measure the sustainability of aviation is CO2 per RPK. So the CO2 emissions per passenger kilometer. And if we look at all the publicly available data from airlines themselves, not estimates published by the airlines between 16 and 2020, it looks like that at least a little bit more than half of the airlines were able to improve their sustainability, becoming greener because this ratio is becoming better than before. If you look at the total CO2 emissions, the carbon footprint, it is very clear that the avi aviation industry has expanded its carbon footprint. And this has to be redu reduced to reach net zero, not this figure. This is just by, driven by the fact that um, the produ production volume of the aviation industry exceeds our ability to reduce carbon. And if you have a fleet of certain aircraft and you replace one old aircraft with one modern aircraft, you have an improvement in terms of CO2 emissions per passenger kilometer for sure. But still, it is very likely if you, as long as you grow faster than you are able to reduce CO2, you will improve your carbon footprint. And this runs the risk that 10, 15 years from now, the regulator will show up and say, um, you missed the point. You, you did not manage well, market failure. Now it's our turn to impose harsh restrictions to make sure that aviation will reach net zero by 2050. So it's absolutely important that we act preemptively and take all the measures that are needed to avoid the climate risk to become a risk for our industry. Geopolitical risk, the impact of the war against Ukraine. This was um, a flight radar shot, very famous from the first day of the war. So the airspace of the Ukraine was avoided by all means. We still see traffic on Russia, over ba Russia and Belarus, a lot of traffic. With the sanctions, all this is gone. You just have a few aircraft from Chinese airlines crossing Russian airspace, but all else is gone. Nobody knows how long that will take. If you look at a few examples uh, of hardship, um, this is Finnair Flight 73 Helsinki to Tokyo. This is from Helsinki to Tokyo, the original routing all the way across Russian airspace. Now they have to fly across the North Pole, a, a detour of equivalent of roughly four hours more. And these four hours more flight time on a single flight, plus of course the, the, uh, the flight time needed to, for, for, for feeder and defeater flights. Imagine the extra fuel burn. Imagine that the fuel is getting more and more expensive at the same time. Bear in mind that if you fly a super long distance, you cannot simply tank more, take on more fuel because if you take on more fuel, you have to reduce the weight of the payload, passengers or cargo to allow the extra uptake of fuel because there's a fixed limit of payload. Look here at the example of JAL 43, the original route from Tokyo to London, all the way across Russian airspace and now at two hours 30 with all the consequences. Nobody knows how long that will last. We did an analysis by analyzing each and every flight published in flight schedules to analyze how this flight is impacted by the flight ban uh, 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 on uh, airspace, no, no fly zones on, in Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. And we kind of geofenced this airspace and analyzed which flight needs to fly a detour. And here you see how much each airline is impacted by share of flights impacted. And here you see the volume of impact in terms of ASK. No surprise that an airline like Finnair, given its geographical location, is severely impacted. Calum is still impacted, not way similar to Finnair, but still you have to fly a lot of detours, similar to Air France, Canada, Lufthansa, Swiss, lot is severely impacted, very close to the Russian border. It's an interesting case, uh, TUI flight Nordic, um, be, being based in, um, in, uh, in, in Scandinavia. The owner 
of TY is a Russian businessman. So that is uh, constraining yourself. For other airlines like Lufthansa, for instance, overflying Russian airspace usually was very expensive in terms of um, overflight fees to the Russian ANSP. This, of course, no longer is necessary. So these airlines save a lot of money. But on the other side, the flight time is extended given the geographic location of airlines like Air France or Lufthansa or British Airways. The pain is limited and you save a lot of money, but it still is a detour. It still requires more fuel. It still needs an extra hour or so flight time on each and every flight to Asia and not only to Asia, to, to India the same. Let's look to predictability. Can these risks be predicted? The dimension of the risk is the one side of the equation. The dimension is what uh, Philippe Paul calls the responsibility or the loss given default, but how likely is it that the risk will materialize? And this is a million dollar question if you can answer that kind of probability of default. And this is what data science comes into play. If we try to apply a little data science to our aviation industry, think of the basic types of airline strategies. Airlines pursue either of two basic strategies. You either strive for as low as possible unit costs or you strive for as high as possible, as high as possible unit revenues. If your strategy is about very low unit costs, there are certain, certain things you do or you don't. You avoid long haul flights because they are expensive. You strive for high simplicity of fleet because that's cost efficient. As a consequence of the simplicity of fleet, you have a high homogeneity of your stage links. No transfer, point to point only because uh, uh, um, anything but transfer, uh, transfer adds a lot of complexity costs. And for the same reason, decentralized structure of network to keep entry hurdles and exit hurdles as low as possible. You can measure all these characteristics and for each airline, each month for the last 20 years, we have hundreds of those KPIs for each individual airline. What we find out is for the population of the successful low-cost carriers, all these KPIs highly correlate. And if they do, you can aggregate these KPIs into a single composite index, which we call point-to-point -point strengths, which uses from zero, very poor point-to-point -point strengths, to one, very high point-to-point -point strengths. So no surprise that an airline like Ryanair ranks very high on this axis. In this portfolio, each bubble is an airline. The size of the bubble corresponds to the seat capacity of that respective airline. The same applies to um, high unit revenues, hub and spoke. If you operate a hub and spoke network and you want to achieve high unit revenues, you depend on long haul traffic. If you depend on long haul traffic, you depend on operating a central hub to accommodate the transfer traffic. And what you compete is for many and many seamless transfer connections. So the competition about Frankfurt Hub and Charles de Gaulle Hub is about transfer traffic from, say, Manchester to Istanbul. And each of these airlines compete to have an as high as possible share of that kind of traffic. You cannot avoid, if you are in this business, that you have a very complex fleet because uh, to fly from, say, Frankfurt to Hamburg takes another type of aircraft than flying from Frankfurt to Los Angeles or Hong Kong. So inevitably, it's not a mistake, it's not a management mistake, it's by the nature of this business model, you will end up with a rather complex fleet with a high diversity of stage lengths. Again, you can measure all these characteristics and they correlate highly for the successful large uh, hub and spoke carriers, single hub or multi hub, doesn't matter, they correlate. And if so, you again can create a single composite index going from zero to one, so no surprise that Ryanair qualifies, sorry, Ryanair qualifies as a very poor hub and spoke carrier, whereas Qatar Airways, Delta, Lufthansa, KLM qualifies very well positioned hub and spoke carriers, being at the same time very poorly positioned on this axis. There is no way you can be strong in both dimensions because you cannot operate 
in a simple fleet and a complex fleet at the same time, just to give you an example. If you take the bird's perspective and look at the root uh, or network structures of these airlines, Ryanair serves a network all over Europe, trying to connect as many destinations with as many other destinations within this network without too much concentration on particular airports. The opposite is the network of Qatar Airways, one central hub and these famous routes to all the economic centers of the world with zero connections between the destinations. Everything is strict hubbed to Qatar. Very similar to Emirates, slightly different from Etihad, but this is the best possible incarnation of a single hub concept. And we all thought, as said, this is wonderfully diversified. As a cluster risk, it's a horror because you depend on the ability to serve long haul destinations. United operating a multi-hub system uh, to cover the geography, geography of uh, the United States. And this is some niche specialists like Air Carib you know, operating out of uh, Paris to the Caribbean. So it's near the law. If they would face competition, they would exit the market very soon. But this is the picture of competition. And now let's have a look at how some of the airlines that we all know about develop their strategic positioning in this simple strategic framework. Ryanair started in 2003 in a mediocre position and then very rapidly and in highest possible strategic discipline developed its strategic position in strictly parallel to this axis, becoming stronger and stronger and stronger as a point-to-point -point carrier. And with the bubble size getting bigger and bigger, telling me it, this airline is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as a consequence of being able, because of its strategic positioning is improving, the airline is getting more valuable, more valuable, more valuable. Qatar Airways certainly did not have in mind to become a world-known low-cost carrier, but starting in a uh, not too different position, but then in lightning speed, developing Doha as one of the leading hubs of the world. Quickly developing in this direction, completely disregarding the point-to-point -point strengths. Of course not. You see two glitches here. This was the delayed opening of Hamad International Airport. This was the effect of the blockade by its neighbors. You can see that in those plots. Air Berlin, very sad example. I'm a German. Air Berlin was a German, was a German airline, but still we need to have a look what happened. They started in a very favorable, strong position as a touristic point-to-point -point carrier and diluted their strategic strength year by year, month by month, tried to become a hub carrier, completely failed whilst getting bigger and bigger and expanding the asset base and diluting your strategic positioning and expanding your asset base is an equation that cannot sustain. The result is known. The message here is you can measure the strategic positioning of an airline. And as long as an airline is improving its strategic positioning, either by moving north or moving to the right, this airline obviously is doing something well. And if the airline is moving down or moving to the left or both, obviously the risk of failure is massively increasing. So if we can measure the dynamics of strategic positioning, we can conclude on a certain trend of improving the strategic strengths or diluting your strategic positioning. For those of you who have a keen interest in data science, the algorithm behind is a little bit more detailed. We not only look at the overall strategic positioning, but we look at each individual KPI that goes into this equation and see if it's improving or worsening or staying neutral or whatever. And then it's a system of bonuses or neutral or penalties that we add up, accumulate in a very complex formula to achieve what we call a stress index, which is probably better understood as a competitive well-being, being positive, blue line, positive values, or negative, uh, the red line, uh, pointing to an increasing risk of insolvency.
this model is calibrated to a historic database of airline insolvencies to increase the probability that a negative score truly indicates an increasing risk of insolvency. What we can do is use this strategy map, as we call it, this is this picture, this, this coordinate system here, and do the same and just analyze for the last 20 years, where did the airline insolvencies occur? And they all occur in a very specific, narrow area, which we call internally, don't quote me, the death valley of airline insolvencies. So this strategic positioning is extremely exposed to the risk of insolvency and virtually all of the well-known spectacular insolvencies that we have observed over the last couple of years did happen in this area. There has never been an airline insolvency on the point-to-point uh, -point or low-cost axis if the positioning was above 0.7, never ever. And the cases here in the hub and spoke domain that we observe here are all in the aftermath of 9-11, so special cases as well. But this is really dangerous. So what we measure is, is the airline positioned somewhere in this red zone? Is it approaching the red zone? Is it uh, walking, uh, moving out of the red zone with what speed, what distance, etc., etc.? This is very, very instructive to understand the increasing or decreasing or imminent risk of insolvency for airlines. Proof of the concept. If you look at Primera Airline, uh, Primera Air, which was a Scandinavian um, leisure touristic uh, carrier um, founded not too long ago, but they went belly up in 2018 after an extended period of firing uh, very clear signals of distress. Monarch. Many people said that was an unexpected failure, not at all, because they fired uh, emergency risk signals for years. Not all very strong, but in the years before insolvency, very strong repetitive signals helped me. 9-11, Aigle Azur, a French long-haul low-cost carrier, on, off, on, off, very constant patterns of distress. Tiger Air Australia, no surprise at all, on, off and off, uh, risks of uh, signals of risk. Nock Air, uh, uh, Bangkok-based um, uh, Thai budget carrier, on, off, on, off, at, towards the end, high risks of, of distress until they filed uh, for insolvency. Fly B, not at all a surprise uh, to many, but not to us, uh, because the risk signals were obvious long in advance. So you can measure the indication of risk for a given airline. It's very difficult to project when it will happen or if it will happen, but the risk as such can be measured pretty precise in advance without the need of any financial data. All the data that we use for these kind of calculations is strictly non-financial data, market data. Let's look at resilience. A little bit, just one chart. What if we can measure the risk exposure of each individual airline, we can segment the market. Say we segment the market by the size of the airlines, large airlines, small airlines, medium airlines. And then we simply count in the segment of the large airlines each month, how many of these large airlines send a signal of considerable distress or competitive well-being, negative competitive well-being, the kind of risk indicator I just described. And throughout the pandemic, you can see that the large carriers, they send very strong risk signals, but of all the other classes of airlines, market segments, small or medium, they are well, way better off, significantly more resilient than the small, particularly the medium-sized um, aircraft. So size, pays back, large airlines are significantly more resilient to crisis than smaller or medium-sized airlines. If you look at regions, what is the average risk uh, charge of airlines in North America, Europe, Asia Pacific, Latin America, Middle East, Africa, or Africa, Middle East, uh, uh, or um, Africa, what you can see is, yes, 
North America uh, was always almost extremely resilient to crisis. Of course, North American Airlines responded to the pandemic, but way better than all other nations or regions because of the huge domestic market that does not depend on significant long haul. The high dependence on long haul operations became a huge source of pain and risk for the Middle East carriers, of course. Africa is a disaster, um, remains a disaster, very, very disappointing, frustrating figures. Europe is recovering quickly, but airlines like Air France, British Airways, Lufthansa, KLM depend on long haul operations and the interaction between short haul feeder flights and long haul uh, operations does not work if either one is broken. So that takes its time to recover. We hope we are in um, good shape. These are very recent figures. You could as well, and this of course for me as a strategist is the most interesting market segmentation. Does the airline pursue a distinct hub and spoke strategy? Does it pursue a distinct low cost up in a point to point strategy, or is it, let's call it friendly hybrid strategy, which means it's neither hub nor low cost. It's something, something different. The best performing is hub strategy, followed by low cost and hybrid strategies missing the respective competitive strengths are by far the most vulnerable to crises. So resilience can be measured. Adaptability. Of course, as, a, as an airline, as a lessor, as a bank, as a financial institution, as a strategy advisor, it's all about the ability to adapt to crisis. You want to mitigate the risk of irresponsibility or bad luck by adopting to crises, to, by adopting to flexibility, and by being able to predict the probability of default. And this is a little a borrowing from evolutionary biology, because this is very instructive for us as airline strategists. There are these Darwin's finches. There are 14 distinct species. They descended from the same individuals drifting from continental South America to Galapagos many, many years ago, but they quickly um, created these 14 distinct species, not just similar animals, distinct species very small animals and if the ecosystem changes these little birds can very quickly adapt whatever the ecosystem does they can adapt and they do adapt on the other extreme are the sperm whales extremely adapted to life in oceans certain depth certain salinity of the water certain temperature certain kind of food supply the, the individuals weigh up to 100 tons extremely adaptive to this life in the oceans, hoping that the life and the conditions and the parameters of this life remains the same for millions of years. Hope they are right. If the salinity of the oceans is changing by just a little bit, these animals will extinct. And this happened to Trisatops extinct for at least 60, 60 million years because they were adopted to encounters with Tyrannosaurus, which is another, another dinosaur, both extinct because being adopted to times gone by. So as an airline, of course, you don't want to adopt to times gone by. You need to be very, very specific what kind of risks, environmental conditions, competitive conditions, are likely to remain the same and which ones are likely to change and maybe constantly change. And this is the brute force lesson that the airline and aviation industry has learned in the last two years, like never before, and we still learn. For the airlines and airline manufacturers to play the Darwin's Finch game means flexibility in fleet structures. Keep your fleet structures flexible, avoid a situation like the pandemic where you have to get rid of too big, too old in no time. At the same time, stability, it is very likely that this business will remain tightly regulated, most likely even more. Think of climate uh, sustainability measures 
by uh, by the EU Commission or other uh, governmental authorities. State aid very likely will be available um, for uh, key airlines that the governments depend upon. But if we lack competitiveness, the airlines will disappear from the scene. To give you one last quantitative example of what flexibilization of fleet strategies, of what adaptability means. There's a way to measure, and in my company, we like to measure everything, um, to measure the complexity of fleets. And there is one easy measurement. You might have heard of the Herfidal Hirschman Index or Hirschman Herfidal Index, it uh, doesn't matter. Uh, and that can be nicely be applied to measure airline fleet complexity. So if you have a low score, that means you have a very complex fleet. If you have a score close to one, it means you have a super simple fleet. On average, the hub and spoke airlines, because they operate by far the most complex uh, airlines, the score in, in 2019 on, on average was something like 18 or 0.18. Then in 2020, the airlines not only reduced capacity, but at the same time, they were very careful to ground complete types of aircrafts, complete subfleets. So the number of type of aircraft that they kept operating was uh, uh, reduced, uh, but of the, of the subfleets that were grounded, they grounded the complete subfleet and maintained a few others to save more costs because it's more cost e efficient if you ground an entire fleet and keep the other fleet in place, which is in a 50% or whatever uh, reduction in capacity already. That, that way, if you have a complete subfleet in place, you still maintain your ability for um, uh, operational stability, punctuality, uh, uh, keeping uh, high productivity of, of the crew, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the lessons learned for the airlines was, whoops, this is a very good idea to have a highly adaptive fleet. And the simpler the fleet, the more adaptive. And airlines want to safeguard this new insight into the future. If we, when we observe how the airlines now evolve their fleet, they have no choice. They have, if they want to grow again into capacity, they need to operate the aircraft that they have grounded, at least to a large extent. But what we observe at the same time is, yes, they reactivate many of the grounded aircraft, but not all. If you look at the order books of the airlines, what is very, very clear, the airlines do whatever they can to come out of the crisis with a simpler fleet, because this is more adaptive to what we have to expect in the forthcoming years. And it's also more adaptive for regular operations without uh, the environment of an immediate pandemic or geopolitical risk. So this is a more adaptive strategy to operate a simpler fleet. So reduced fleet complexity is one of the conclusions that we need to learn, starting from what is irresponsible, what is adaptive, the consequence is a reduced fleet complexity, reduce your exposure. To avoid bad luck, you have to bet on predictability. And the answer to predictability is data science. And the combination of both, hopefully, in the future, is higher resilience of the aviation industry, hoping that we will be better able to manage cluster risks, to better solve the equation of cluster risk and economies of scale with the result of being more resilient to crisis. Thank you very much for your attention and I very much look forward to your questions. And I hand over to Sarah, I guess. Thank you, Philip, for this very insightful presentation. Um, we did receive a couple of questions. Um, I will start with the first one. Um, which is more of a, a comment rather than a question to see what your thoughts are. So with the point-to-point -point model, we need to keep in mind that in order to serve the same number of destinations, one need to have a much larger fleet, which will cause the increase in exposure to the asset risk and climate risk. Wonderful. Um, what are your thoughts on this? 
Agreed, completely right. So okay. the, 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 the risk exposure, if, if you, you, you have to bet as a low cost carrier on a single fleet and to connect, to connect everything with everything, you need a larger fleet. Low cost carrier are, are extremely driven by the scale effect of standardization and, si and, and, and size. And if anything goes wrong with the type of aircraft you operate, you have a huge problem. Right. Okay. I absolutely agreed with that comment. Sure, thank you. Um, um, and the next question from the audience is, um, if an airline that uses a multi-hub strategy such as United Airlines, um, is there a way to try to get the best of both worlds? Uh, meaning hub and spoke and uh, point to point? Uh, interesting question. Um, if you operate a very large multi-hub network, you add some of the features of a, of a distributed decentralized network similar to, um, to the low-cost carriers. And this is why, if you remember the chart where I showed the strategy map with United Airlines, etc., they are above the strategic positioning of their European peers, because in Europe, it's almost impossible to operate a true multi-hub system that covers regional space. In, in the US, if you have hubs um, like United or uh, Delta, not to that extent, but American Airlines multi-hub system as well, um, the, the advantages of a, of a decentralized or multi-centric system uh, become more obvious. But for, for these carriers, it's more about regional coverage rather than the strategic advantages of a decentralized network. But the effects are to some extent uh, comparable. But a, even a multi-hub system is a hub system in essence, um, with the hub as the system that creates economies of scale. Whereas for a low-cost carrier, it's the decentralized nature, connecting everything with everything. Um, is very interesting to observe now um, in, in, in the US breeze. Um, they evolve a very strict point-to-point -point network, connecting everything and everything, and very interesting to observe how Delta is responding by means of horsepower of hubbing. Okay, um, thank you for this. The next question is, how are oil prices and relaxation of COVID regulations impacting routing and economics? Is this a trend being monitored from the um, hub and the long haul models? I didn't understand the first quad part of the question. How are prices? How are oil prices, oh, and, oil the prices. Yeah, yeah. and the relaxation of COVID regulations impacting uh, routing and economics? Um, negatively. Um, very obviously, uh, the oil price is detrimental to all kinds of businesses in aviation. If the price goes up, you have to forward the price to, to your customers or to your margin or both. Um, you, there is no business model, no airline strategy um, that is capable uh, to, to, uh, to neutralize or, or offset the impact of increasing fuel prices. Hedging, we know uh, th those airlines who did not hedge and now try to jump on the train. Um, too late. Uh, there is no way to beat the market, uh, the volatility of the market by, 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 by hedging. You cannot be smarter than the, the, than the market, but you cannot avoid the detrimental effect of uh, high fuel prices. If we look forward a little bit, if we look to, to, to SAFs, the SAFs will come. SAFs is the only effective needle mover if we want to become uh, climate neutral in, in any point in time. SAF will be substantially more expensive um, than, than fuel, even more expensive than fuel today. Bear in mind that SAF needs to produce based on completely renewable energies. And renewable energies, first, we don't have them, not yet. They will be very expensive when they come. IATA estimates in the beginning, seven times more expensive. Many years later, two times expensive. If you have an airline that has 25% operating cost or full cost is fuel, and you, if you double that, uh, you have a price increase, a cost increase of 25% for the entire um, uh, airline. And who pays that equation? Uh, the passengers, 
the, the airlines will not be able to afford stuff if the price hike is is uh, that way. So welcome, dear taxpayers. <laughs> That's right. a the, the increasing cost of fuel is not limited to to fossil fuel. The massive effect will be with stuff. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Philip. And our next question is, could the A321LR introduce a point-to-point -point model to long-haul traffic? Sorry, I couldn't understand. Could you say it again? Um, could the a A321LR aircraft type introduce the point-to-point -point model to long-haul traffic? Ah, okay. <laughs> there have been so many attempts with so many different type of aircraft uh, to establish low-cost long-haul that um, whenever it happens, I jump up and down because I like the entrepreneurial spirit to set up a new business model, uh, breaking compromises. All those experiments until now have failed. Um, okay. Sorry, if I may add a sentence. The, the, yep. the, the 21 long range, I'm very bullish on this aircraft, but not on, um, on, uh, on, on on low cost, but on hubbing. Okay. Because it will allow to add new new routes to hubbing models. Okay. Um, on the st stress test graph for airlines, uh, which have defaulted, what would an airline like Ryanair look like? Would there be negative red lines seen in these type of types of healthy um, zero. airlines. In the crisis, in the pandemic, a little bit. But um, sorry, I didn't show good examples, but there are many airlines without any glitch into the red. Uh, all the big okay. names, think of Turkish Airlines, think of Ryanair, Wizz, United, all these blue chip airlines, all in the blue. And is it normal to have stress blips for any airline or is any dip an indicator of concern? No, we, are, we have seen some signals, for instance, in Europe in 2016, we saw some indications for a month or two, little glitches, steep down. That was because some airlines had operational problems and they fixed the aircraft, adding a little bit time here and there, slowing down the connections, de-peaking their peaks in the systems. For the computer, it looks like hmm, restructuring, which it is. Uh, but it's not meant as a restructuring because of, of a threat, but it is to fix some operational problems. You see that, but you can already identify because where it's coming from, it goes down, it will go up again. You know that. Uh, but yes, you, the, the methodology as such is very sensitive even to operational fixes, particularly if, if you uh, de-peak peaks uh, in, in, in your wave system, etc. Right. Okay. And our next question is, to what extent does it make sense for a hub and spoke airlines to subcontract regional feeder operations or to wet lease capacity? I think it makes a lot of sense to wet lease um, if it's a cost effective uh, means to have the operations outsourced to an operator who can offer better cost. Um, the headache, uh, for instance, comes um, with CO2 emissions. If you look at the rules, who is accountable for the emissions of regional aircraft in Europe, the regime is very different from, from the US. But from an economic point of view, if I were a CEO and I have the option to outsource uh, some operations to a lower cost platform, I would do so. And some airlines, uh, outsource some other airlines uh, set up their own lower cost operating platforms. Eurowings of Lufthansa, it's not a low cost platform. It's, it's far away from being low cost, but it's a lower cost platform of Lufthansa. And therefore it's rightfully adjusted because their operating cost is well below Lufthansa. So it's a good idea to have those platforms. If you own them, nice. If you lease them, fine. Whatever makes economic sense. Okay, and maybe just one last one to, to wrap up this session. Um, if evolution is the key to survival and resilience, how do airlines adapt since each model serves specific needs like regional or intercontinental routes? 
especially network carriers that serve multiple markets. Correct, correct. Um, we have done one analysis, um, sorry I didn't show, where we plot the complexity of a fleet versus its strategic positioning. And what you can see is that you should expect a certain level of complexity as a function of the strategic positioning. If you operate a long haul network with a feeder network, you should expect you need a certain level of complexity, but not more. Less makes no sense either. So what we observe is a wide range of complexities typical for a given strategic positioning. It means many airlines overstretch the diversity and, 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 and the complexity of, of their fleet, the many airlines. And there's a lot of room to simplify. And when we discuss with, with airlines uh, around the globe, the large clients, the, the large airlines, they all have their plans in the draw or work on the plans to simplify um, uh, their fleet. It's like a discussion between the trip cost versus unit cost at the end of the day. Okay, um, I think uh, maybe just really one last one. Um, how significant in your opinion is the current signs of manpower shortage risks, which um, we currently observe in all segments, such as cockpit crew, engineers, MRO? That's a significant risk. Um, and and it's it depends a little bit on the on the uh, labor laws in the respective countries. In my country Germany, we have a special law where you, you don't have to lay off people in a in a situation of crisis. Uh, you put them into kind of hibernation mode, and the a paycheck is paid by the government uh, to a, a rather great extent. So when you expect the crisis to be over in some time you just activate these employees and they know the rules, they know the procedures, they have all the skills, they have all the training, and it takes zero time to ramp up. And, uh, if you have to fire all the people, you have to rehire, retrain, requalify, and that takes a lot of time. So um, in, in an industry like this, which is crisis prone, um, I don't know if that term exists in English, but if, if you repetitively go into crisis, I think a, uh, you need some special labor laws that protect you from this up and down. Right. Okay, and just uh, a general uh, comment, uh, since you've provided all this very useful, insightful information, do you, um, do you publish any sort of uh, uh, newsletter or any kind of publication uh, on you know, a frequent basis uh, on market forecasts or something that our, our, our audience uh, yes. could, could uh, look at. Yes. But, but we don't forecast, not in the sense of projecting. We measure what the airlines publish on their own data. But this, we publish that each month and send me an email and, and uh, you, I will put you on the distribution list. It's free. Okay. All right. Great. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, this wraps up this session. Uh, I will remind you all that the, this session was recorded and will be published on our on the iStat website within the next day or two. So um, feel free to share it and uh, look at it again if you've missed anything. Um, and uh, please take a look at the website. We will be having more learning labs in the near future. Um, so um, just keep, a, keep an eye out for those. And we look forward to uh, hosting you again. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Philip, very much. And um, thank, you, thank you, John. Thank you. All the best.